This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Today we present Court of Appeals Judge Jeffrey Sutton speaking on February 13th of 2008, the third annual birthday celebration for Robert H. Jackson. Greg Peterson gives the introduction. This is the third annual Robert H. Jackson birthday celebration. Last year, as you recall, we had Nuremberg prosecutor Henry King. Today we have the Honorable Jeffrey Sutton. You folks from Warren, he's a big deal. He's a big deal because uh, his resume brings him to Warren, Pennsylvania, and I'm sure he'll talk about that, where his mother and aunt were all part of this Warren, Pennsylvania community. And at the same time, he hasn't lost track of his roots as he went on to becoming a graduate from Williams he, uh, College. He graduated from Ohio State Law School. He became a justice, or a law clerk for Justice Lewis Powell and Antonin Scalia. Trust me, not everybody gets a chance to be a law clerk for a justice of the United States Supreme Court. He then became elevated to being one of the youngest, if not the youngest, members of the Circuit Court of Appeals, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's a big deal, folks. You got the United States Supreme Court, and you got the Circuit Court of Appeals, and you have uh, Warren's Jeff Sutton in that category. But let me tell you also two vignettes that occurred at the Jackson Center which helped to put this into perspective. A couple years ago, we were at Chautauqua and we had the opportunity to have Linda Greenhouse, who is the chief reporter for the Supreme Court from the New York Times. She spoke and everybody was riveted, packed house. And when she got done, most people would go up to her and see her. Instead, she came down and sought out our honored guest today. Similarly, this past summer at the Jackson Center, we honored Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and we had in the sea of humanity, Justice O'Connor paused and pointed out Judge Jeffrey Sutton and extolled his virtues in front of the class. And I know he was embarrassed by all of this, but it was one of those opportunities where folks of that ilk say that you are quite, a, quite extraordinary, you believe he's quite extraordinary. So we couldn't be happier that he agreed to be the third annual Robert H. Jackson lecturer here in Warren County, Pennsylvania. So without further ado, the Honorable Jeffrey Sutton. Oh, thank you, Greg. Uh, very generous as always. Um, I am very proud of my Warren roots. My uh, mother, Nancy Dalrymple Sutton, grew up here. My grandparents from here, my uncle and aunt, uh, Chase and Mary Putman, Putman are somewhere I'm looking for them. And then Tom and Alan Paquette, my cousins, are here as well. And uh, we get here, I don't get to Warren every summer, I get to Chautauqua every summer, and probably to Warren every other summer. My, my parents met in Chautauqua, so this, this part of the country is very important to us. Uh, and it, it's, it's been so much fun to learn about Justice Jackson's connection to the area. Well, I'm going to keep this relatively informal. I see, I see the clock moving. I'm going to try to do this in about 20, 30 minutes because I'd like to leave some time for questions. One great thing about questions when you're a speaker is you're always sure at least one person is listening. Uh, so I, I, will, I, will, I will save a little time for that. Um, you know, Henry King spoke last year. Henry King had some advantages over me. Uh, he was a fellow prosecutor at Nuremberg. He, of course, was able to give firsthand accounts of Nuremberg, firsthand accounts of Justice Jackson, uh, you're not going to get any first-hand accounts from me today. Uh, Justice Jackson died suddenly in 1954, and I was born not so suddenly in 1960, so uh, we didn't overlap much. Um, what I'm going to give is basically three different talks, one that's appropriate for a birthday celebration, one that uh, pretends to be somewhat informative, and then one that's about a, a somewhat unhappy event in uh, Justice Jackson's life. Um, so, the one that's appropriate for a birthday, uh, February 13, 1892, 
Uh, I majored in history in college. I was curious, is this, was this a promising day on which to be born as a matter of history? Um, the answer is uh, definitely not. Uh, February 13th before 1892, as best I can tell, nothing significant had ever happened in the history of man that was useful, good, and important. There were a few events, however, that did stand out. Um, in 1542, Catherine Howard, uh, Henry VIII's fifth wife, was beheaded February 13th. 1633, on February 13th, Galileo entered Rome uh, to be tried on charges for heretically believing that the earth revolved around the sun. And last of all, in 1866, Jesse James and his gang robbed their first bank. <laughs> so if you were Justice Jackson's parents, you can't control labor, particularly back in those days. Uh, this was not a promising day to leaving to the side. It was the 13th. You know, you might not have liked that either. So what would you have thought of your justice? Well, he might become headless, a heretic, or a thief. Uh, as it turns out, February 13th, 1892 was a very promising day. Um, I, read, I read some stories, did anything else happen on that day? Well, of course, the papers did not cover Jackson's birth. They didn't have that kind of foresight. It did turn out, however, that there was, a, according to the New York Times, the paper of record, that on that day, there was a remarkable, I, do you quote them, spectacular exposure of the northern lights from Iowa, the Atlantic coast, and the New York Times said it was the most impressive uh, viewing of the northern lights ever on American soil, at least up to 1892. So all you need is three wise men, and you've, you've got yourself a pretty, pretty good Justice Jackson story. Of course, things did, you know, save for the northern lights, save for being born in Warren County. Um, this was not a guy that you would have thought would get very far. Um, he was a country boy, born to a country family, no connections that would usually are necessary to have success at the national level. As Greg pointed out, um, he obviously had a very good education through high school. I don't know who those teachers were, but they deserve an awful lot of credit. But no college education, one year of law school, um, and still he does, he does everything he does. Chief Justice Rehnquist, who clerked for Jackson, I think in about 1951 and 52, wrote an article about uh, the justice, and he made the points I just made and said, Jackson, in many ways, is a lot like a Lincoln. And you know, that's, you know, that people don't, even Greg doesn't compare people to Lincoln very easily. Uh, but I, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to take Chief Justice Rehnquist a couple steps further. Um, so you have the obvious things, no education, self-educated, uh, country, they're both country lawyers, they both had great senses of humor, they were both terrific storytellers throughout their lives, they always had this kind of common sense and common touch that never left them, no matter how successful uh, they were. They became great writers. Um, so there, there really is something there. The two things, though, that I like the most about thinking about Lincoln versus Jackson or Lincoln and Jackson is, one, I think they both fought by writing. Uh, most people, when they write, they think first, they make some notes, then they write. I think for both of them, the act of thinking was the act of writing, and the two went together. Probably explains why they were such effective writers. Um, there's a book, if you're interested in the point I'm making, I think it's called Lincoln's Sword, which came out in the last year or two, and it makes the point that Lincoln's most effective weapon was his pen. And in doing that, it, it elaborates on the notion that every time Lincoln had to wrestle with a problem, whether it was when to give the Gettysburg Address, when to do the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the second inaugural, he worked through these things through writing. Jackson was the same way. He, I, I've not heard of any other justice, much less a judge, that had this habit. He would write draft opinions before oral argument. Now, as a judge, I can tell you that's just extraordinary and, to my mind, stupid. The reason I think it's stupid is you don't know that you're going to be assigned the case. Uh, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and why in the world you'd write an opinion before argument when you might not get the case assignment is really hard for me to fathom, except if that's the way you think. And uh, that clearly was part of Jackson's way. The other comparison that intrigues me is obviously Lincoln and Jackson had this. They did have this natural talent, Springfield, uh, Warren, whatever it was, the water. Um, and they also had ambition. I mean, you have to be ambitious to do what they did. But most people with talent and ambition that succeed, they follow the madding crowd. 
So they do what those above them do, and once they get there, they continue to be fairly conventional. Um, not true with Lincoln and Jackson. Uh, they remained individuals throughout. That kind of country lawyer, common sense, common touch never eluded them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's extraordinary. And I, I guess it proves that they were both loyal to their roots and they never forgot where they came from. For Jackson, the best illustration of that is his opinion in the steel seizures case. That's the case in which um, Harry Truman tried to uh, seize the steel mills to preempt a union strike during the Korean War. And uh, Jackson was not assigned the opinion. As you now know, he already had written one. But uh, he was not assigned the opinion. The opinion went to Justice Black. And Justice Jackson, the individual that he was, still felt a need to write separately why he was concurring. He was still agreeing with Justice Black. And um, that opinion, the concurrence, has become the model for all Supreme Court opinions and all debates about what kind of executive branch power a president has and what kind of power he does not have. So that's the birthday talk. Here's the somewhat informative talk. So the somewhat informative talk is, let's compare Jackson's court to today's Supreme Court. And um, what, what are the similarities and what are the differences? Well, as a matter of composition of the two courts, uh, they could not be more different in my view. The Jackson court was filled with lots of statesmen and politicians. So for example, five members of the Jackson court, and I'm, when I think of the Jackson court, I'm, I'm thinking of 1952, but this is roughly true throughout his tenure. Five members of that court were very prominent members of FDR's or Truman's administration. So they came out of politics in high level executive branch service. The current Supreme Court does not have a single member that served at such a high level. So when I say high level, I'm talking Secretary of the Treasury, Attorney General, Solicitor General. The current U.S. Supreme Court has none of that. Five members of the Jackson Court had run for office at least once, most of them several times, and obviously one. Um, three of them were U.S. Senators. I don't think a single member of today's U.S. Supreme Court ever ran for office, um, unless you count you know, ninth grade class president. Uh, but so, so another serious distinction. Two members, just two members of Jackson's court had ever been judges before they went on the court. And I would guess that for both of them, these were kind of inconsequential jobs before they became justice on the court. On today's court, all nine members of the court not only were judges before they went on the court and were elevated, but every single one of them was on the Federal Court of Appeals. So the tr it's really kind of training by being a judge as opposed to training by being a politician. On Jackson's court, there was just one professor, Felix Frankfurter. On today's court, you have three uh, people that made their name as professors, Scalia, Ginsburg, and Breyer. And Justice Kennedy was a, kind of an adjunct professor throughout his life. Then the last one that's quite striking is that on Jackson's court, there was just one Republican. On today's court, there's just two Democrats. Uh, so things have changed. Now, you could, you, we, maybe we can talk about this during the question time, but uh, which is better? I can make a case for both of them. On the one hand, I don't think you would have gotten Brown versus Board of Education, a 9-0 decision in 1954, two years after I'm talking about, without a court filled with people that understand, understood the political world, understood executive branch service, understood what was going on in the country, understood what elected officials were going through. I'm just not sure you would have gotten that on a court filled with professors and lower court judges. Um, so we were fortunate to have that kind of a court then. On the other hand, of course, I'm a court of appeals judge, so I have a slight bias in favor of court of appeals judges. On the other hand, I don't think being a judge or a justice is, a, is necessarily a great job for a former politician. Most politicians are extroverts. They like to be out. And I, I love my job, don't get me wrong, but it is not a job for an extrovert. Um, you're, it's, it's writing, it's reading, it's thinking, and then when you're done with that and you want something new, it's writing, reading, and thinking. Um, that's all there is to it. Uh, I get no phone calls, I get no emails. If I get a phone call half mid-morning, mid I'm inclined to tell my assistant, tell them I'll return the call in the afternoon. Not because I'm too busy, I just want something to look forward to. Uh, so I, I don't think, and I don't think an unhappy judge is going to be a good judge or a good justice. And I think there were many members, interestingly, of the Jackson court that didn't take naturally to being justices. Douglas spent his entire career trying to be president. Um, and and I, we can talk, we'll talk about Nuremberg later. I think Jackson went to Nuremberg 
to try out not being on the court. Um, I don't think he was happy at that time. Um, his favorite job was being the Solicitor General. He loved being an advocate. He was a great justice, and I think he still liked it. But my point is, people in the political world don't always make a seamless transition to being a judge or a justice. So that's one comparison, the composition of the court. Another one that people are usually interested in is, are the justices actually doing their work? Um, and when people are skeptical whether the justices are doing their work, they often think, well, the law clerks are doing the work. The law clerks are the one deciding which cases to take, how to vote, writing the opinions. And of course, former law, law clerks love to tell that story. I'm a former law clerk. There's nothing more exciting to me than trying to convince somebody that when I was clerking for Justice Scalia, I was writing all of those witty, excellent opinions. Um, of course, that's a complete lie. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is, I think in Jackson's time, and on today's court, the clerks do have an important role, but I wouldn't get too worried about their making decisions they shouldn't be making. The one thing that you might, I sometimes get a little skeptical about, is I think probably some justices perhaps delegate a little more of the writing than perhaps they should to their clerks. That was not true of Jackson, and it was not true of most of Jackson's colleagues. Uh, Jackson always wrote first drafts. He, of course, didn't have a computer as an option. He hand wrote them out. Um, as we talked about earlier, he loved to think by writing. Um, and if you know his writings, I mean, they're just unbelievable. Uh, Rehnquist, who clerked for the, um, Jackson, loved to tell the story about how Jackson that term was kind to him and said, Bill, um, you've been really good to me. I I'm going to let you uh, try your hand at an opinion. And if, if you do a respectable job, I won't edit it too heavily. So Rehnquist worked hard. This is, of course, a dog of a case, uh, not interesting at all. And, uh, but for Chief Justice, then Bill Rehnquist, later Chief Justice Rehnquist, this was a big day. Uh, so he worked very hard, wrote what he thought was a terrific opinion. Sure enough, Jackson did not edit that much of it. And the day it came out, uh, Jackson, uh, excuse me, Rehnquist was talking to a fellow clerk. And he said to him, kind of in a hopeful, hopeful way, um, did you happen to see Justice Jackson's opinion the other day. And the clerk said, oh, I did. It was just so unlike the justice. It was so pedestrian. And uh, <laughs> so a, a crestfallen Bill Rehnquist uh, knew he wasn't quite up to that level. Um, but I, I think in Jackson's day there, I, I have heard from some clerks at that time that uh, there were some justices that probably did delegate a fair bit of the writing uh, to the clerks. Um, but even then, it's still the justices obviously making the decisions. By the time I was clerking in the early 90s, and I think the same is true today, the one thing that's changed is technology. And um, a lot of the justices, including Justice Scalia, who is, uh, is a f fine writer, um, he's up there with Jackson, um, he would still get drafts from uh, people like me. Uh, he, of course, would spin straw into gold when he was done with it. But I think the reason he didn't write a first draft was that it was just a lot more efficient to get on a computer disk all of the citations, kind of the organization of the argument. It's, if, I don't know how many of you know are computer literate, but it's really pretty easy to edit a document on a computer. In fact, I, as, as a judge myself now, probably 90% of my cases, I get a draft from a clerk, and then I'd like to think edit it quite effectively. And 10% I'll write on my own for whatever reason. So the clerks are, I wouldn't say the clerks have really that much influence there. Probably the biggest thing the clerks do these days is they have a, a big role in deciding which cases the court should take. Um, the court gets about eight to 9,000 petitions a year. Um, that's a lot of petitions. Uh, someone worked it out once. If the justices of the Supreme Court were to read every one of these petitions, they'd have to spend, I think, uh, they couldn't sleep and they couldn't do anything else but maybe uh, spend an hour or two a day on the merits cases. Of course, that's, they're not going to do that. So the reality is the justices rarely read any of the cert petitions. And what happens instead is the law clerks write summary memos about the petitions and make recommendations. And I didn't think when I was clerking at the court that was a very harmful practice. And in Jackson's day, it worked pretty much the same way. So there really isn't much difference there. I would say the clerks, the big difference in Jackson's day was there were only 1,500 petitions a year. And so there wasn't as much for the court to worry about in terms of sheer numbers. The other difference, and this is really a little more historical, it's pretty big generalization, but it, it has one point at the end that you might be interested in. If you were to generalize about the last century in the role of the Supreme Court, you'd say something like this, that in the first half of the last century, 
The Democrats, the liberals, the progressives, were the ones that were very much in favor of judicial restraint. So if you were hearing election talk and what kind of judges and justices we want, it was we want judges that stay back, they let the lawmakers uh, make the laws, they let the democratic process work its will, and that's, the, that's where Justice Jackson cut his teeth. And so to liberals like Jackson, Democrats like Jackson, they were very frustrated with a very conservative court because in the first half of the last century it was a court controlled primarily by conservatives and Republicans. And they were invalidating all kinds of progressive legislation in the 20s, the teens, and the 30s. And then, as I think you all know, by the time Roosevelt came into office, they were invalidating all of his, his New Deal programs. Well, Roosevelt tried to change that by changing the number of members in the court. That didn't quite work. But then he got enough seats filled that gradually the court was filled with people like Jackson. And so for a while, they were prevailing. The Democrats were in control, Democratic appointees were running the courts, and they were letting the New Deal legislation move forward without invalidating it. What's so fascinating about Jackson's career is he straddled this big transformation because in about the mid to late 40s, suddenly everything flipped to what we now know. Today, of course, if you listen, if you listen to John McCain give a talk, he's going to tell you that he's going to put on judges and justices that believe in judicial restraint. And the Democrats are going to say, no, we're going to put on judges that think it's appropriate to flex your muscles when there are individual liberties at stake. Some, at some point, the two parties switched, and Jackson was right there in the middle just as, as it was happening. In fact, in fact, I think for Jackson, this was one of the most difficult parts of his career because he grew up as someone who believed in judicial re restraint. He and Frankfurter were great allies on this point. Initially, he was an ally with other FDR appointees like Douglas and Black, but suddenly about the mid-40s, late, late 40s, early 50s, half of the FDR appointees switched and they started to say, you know what, we've been watching what's going on in the Jim Crow South, we can't sit back, these are problems that have got to, get, got to be corrected, and so they became more active, you know, you maybe you don't want to use the word activist, but certainly far more active than they had been their first um, first years on the court. Jackson, to his credit, stayed fairly consistent. Uh, he obviously, in cases like Korematsu, Brown versus Board of Education, when he thought the government, state legislature had really crossed the line, he was going to step in. But for the most part, he was not nearly as aggressive as Douglas and, um, and Black and some others. And I think that has a lot to do with the tension between the two. And that gets to my last point, which is this unhappy event in uh, Jackson's life. So in 1946, he is at Nuremberg. And uh, just to go back for a second on a point I mentioned earlier, it's an extraordinary thing for a US Supreme Court justice to pick up his bags, leave DC, not decide cases. I think it was 17 months. It was over a year, I think maybe 17 months. So he wasn't deciding cases. He's out of the country. And he's running the prosecution at Nuremberg. As important as Nuremberg was, as lucky as we are that he did this, it was still an extraordinary thing to do. And I frankly think, as I suggested earlier, that one of the reasons he did this, and one of the reasons he accepted this invitation from Truman, is I just don't think he was that happy at the court. I think his friendship with people like Black and Douglas was being frayed because of this transformation I was talking about. They were becoming more aggressive about interpreting the Constitution aggressively. Um, when it came to applying the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment, then at least he and Frank Witter were comfortable. And I also think there was personal tension. I think there was ambitions colliding uh, in the, in the mid-40s. So in 1946, while he's in Nuremberg, uh, Chief Justice Stone dies. Now, if you're a justice on the Supreme Court, the odds, you know, if the stars have aligned sufficiently for you to be on the Supreme Court, the odds are high you're not going to stop there. You're going to go down in history as the next Holmes or Brandeis, or maybe better yet, be a chief justice. Everyone on the Supreme Court wants to be chief if they can be chief. And I don't think Jackson was any exception. What made it even more tempting for Jackson is when Stone was made chief, Roosevelt considered him for a time. And I think had Roosevelt still been alive, when Stone died, Jackson would have been chief justice. So Jackson is all ears when he hears that um, Stone has died and there's now a vacancy in the chief justiceship. He hears word back across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean that uh, Truman is initially inclined to pick him as the Chief Justice. Um, just what he wants, 
that looks pretty good. And once word gets out that that's what Truman wants to do, what I think you could call was a vicious campaign against Jackson soon begins. Now, I'm not prepared to say that it was Black and Douglas that were behind this. What I'm quite confident is true is that Black and Douglas's emissaries, their supporters, were behind this. At the end of the day, lots of people went to Truman saying Jackson should not be Chief Justice, said lots of nasty things about Jackson. Of course, Jackson was in no position to defend himself being in Nuremberg this whole time. Ultimately, Truman changes his mind and gives the Chief Justiceship to Vincent. So, unhappy event, um, maybe should have been left there. Um, Jackson can't take it. Um, rather than letting that go, um, Jackson sends a letter to a reporter. And in the letter, he accuses Black, Justice Black, of ethical improprieties, specifically for sitting on cases in which former partners of his law firm were arguing, cases in which he had a conflict of interest. Now, in the sweep of Supreme Court history, that doesn't happen every day. Um, it's probably happened before. I don't, I'm not aware of it happening. I'm certainly not aware of it in the last 30 years, and that I would know, and I'm not aware of it happening at any other time. It's a, it's a pretty serious thing to do, to make charges publicly against a colleague. Um, there's no turning back when you do that. Um, why, why am I telling you this? Why, uh, why do I find it interesting? Well, when I, there's two biographies. So there's one that's been done by Eugene Gerhardt. Uh, John Barrett uh, who's preparing one, The St. John's Law Professor, which you all have got to read when it comes out. Um, and when I read Gerhardt's biography of the justice, I just was so stunned by the event because everything about Jackson's life was so right, good, and perfect. And this seemed like such a colossal miscalculation and such poor, poor judgment. Um, so why did he do it? Um, well, the, the side that doesn't make things any better is that I think Black and uh, Jackson had become um, foes. They were FDR lieutenants, they were uh, FDR's favorite sons, and now they were fighting for a job that only one of them could have. And uh, that's a very Washington story, and I guess the, 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 the coda is very Washington as well. I don't think that's what happened. I think what happened was that Jackson was, his problem was not that he didn't get the chief justiceship. I think his problem was he learned what had been said to Truman and what had been publicly said about him. And that as a matter of honor, pride, but I'd like to think more honor, he felt that the record had to be corrected. And so he had to respond. Um, it, it, that episode did not, has not hurt um, him in posterity uh, whatsoever. It obviously doesn't change his writings. Uh, but it was a difficult episode. And uh, I have to ask myself, would I have done the same thing? I'd like to think not, but I certainly understand the honor part of it. Um, Remember, he was an individual. He was always an individual, and I think uh, that, that maybe played a role. So, in conclusion, Agatha Christie, uh, I'm told, was married to an archaeologist. And she liked to say she loved being married to an archaeologist because the older she got, the more interested in her her spouse became. <laughs> so, Justice, Justice Jackson is our Agatha Christie. The older he gets, the more interested in him we become. And so why is, why is that? A um, couple reasons. Uh, well, Warren County, it's quite natural. It's never going to stop. But that's not, it's not just Warren County. It's among the bar. Um, even before I knew Justice Jackson was from Warren County, I knew about his opinions and knew how well done they were and had a high regard for him. So what, what uh, exactly is going on there? Some of it is that he was fortunate. He was a justice during this transformative period that was just so critical in Supreme Court history. He was there when they were deciding some just critical, critical cases for establishing the role of the court in American history. And then he had the good fortune either of writing the majority opinions in those cases or concurrences. And then you add to it that he wrote like no other. And I think that really helps to explain the legacy. The other point is at the court, there's really one debate when it comes to constitutional cases. And that debate is always conflicts between liberty, order, the individual versus government. And in Supreme Court history, you get justices that incline one side or the other. 
And what was so terrific about Jackson, and I think reflected his roots and reflected this common touch, pragmatic approach to the law, was that he never always ended up on one side. He was, he, he, you know, one day he would be with the government, the next day he wouldn't. And so I think he was always very good and very effective at trying to figure out that exact balance between liberty and order, the government and the individual. And uh, so I think, that, and I think that's not, that's why he's well known today, that's why he's revered today, but I think that's why 50 years from now um, that will still be, still be true. The, uh, he said once that um, about Washington, which I don't know that he ever cared for, um, I think he loved it while he was having such tremendous success as general counsel of the IRS, head of the antitrust division, head of the tax division, attorney general, solicitor general. I mean, that had to be pretty exciting, just one step up after the other, and then finally being a justice. But by the time I think he was a justice, I think he saw a side of Washington that was a little less flattering, perhaps shown by the, the Nuremberg um, black experience. Uh, he said once that uh, Washington, uh, for a public official, uh, Washington takes everything and gives nothing. Well, I think what he would say about Warren County, it, it was that it gave everything and it asked nothing in return. So um, I'd love to take questions and uh, thank you for uh, listening and coming out in this very cold night. <laughs> A member of the audience comments that Jackson was a country boy and he could see patterns in his decisions from growing up in a rural area. Well, you know, one illustration of that is uh, while he was on the court, I think it was a high school student wrote him a, a letter asking him, what are your favorite hobbies? And uh, he responded by saying, well, I, I hate games where you keep score. So he said, I don't play golf, I don't play bridge. And I think that grew out of his days as an advocate and on the Supreme Court. It's, you know, it's zero sum. You're, you're winning or you're losing. And he, he didn't care for that. So then he said, what are my favorite hobbies? Horseback riding and hiking. And uh, obviously that's where he got that from. But I mean, that's the, uh, you know, how do you describe the, everyone who gets in the Supreme Court is fairly smart. Uh, some would say very smart. Um, and once they're there, they're writing for history. So they're all trying to write Jackson-like opinions. Why does Jackson write him but the others don't? And uh, I think it's, it's the country lawyer in him. I, I, that to me, it's the, it was the common sense, the common touch, the pragmatism that was not doctrinaire. It was not about the Washington rules. Um, he, learned how to, he learned how to survive and thrive in Washington, that's for sure. But he didn't lose that. And uh, that's, that's his legacy, which is, is exciting. Judge. You had a chance to argue 12 cases in front of the United States Supreme Court. I doubt if anybody in the audience had a chance to even think about that. How does one prepare to stand before the nine justices of the Supreme Court? Uh -huh. Well, it's, um, it's terrifying. I wouldn't recommend it. I, uh, <laughs> every, before every argument, as I was getting ready for argument, I just say to myself, why am I doing this? I mean, I, I'm a free man. I don't have to do this for a living. I'm frantic. I want to lose my lunch, and I and, uh, just am very unhappy. Uh, and then when I was done, I said, I can't wait to do this again. Um, it, it's a lot of preparation. I mean, just a lot. I mean, it's not preparation. It's obsession. I mean, I, I was a useless spouse and father for the two to three weeks before every argument. And... Uh, but it's, it's thrilling, and, and the, the justices do their own work. And it's, you, you, if, you, if you get a chance to watch, if you haven't already, watch a Supreme Court argument, it's really worth it, because I think you'd be, you'd be proud to be in a country where that branch of government is that effective. Because when you're at an oral argument, whether you know anything about the case or not, it'll be very clear to you that the justices are really prepared, are very smart, and this is just an impressive part of government at work. And so when you've really practiced, it's really exciting um, to be up there with such smart people going back and forth. Um, you know, Grave said so many nice things about me. I should, I, I, kind of full disclosure, why don't I tell you about my first oral argument, which is show you what a clown I truly am. Uh, so I was very nervous for my first argument. Um, how old was I? So I was, I was you know, uh, six years out of law school and uh, didn't think I was really prepared for this, but wasn't about to tell my client that. 
And uh, so I worked as hard as one can possibly work to get ready for a case. And uh, still was very, very nervous. Uh, there are 30-minute arguments. And the first 15, I got to tell you, they went pretty well. And the, the big problem was that about 15 minutes, I realized that. And this kind of terrible thing goes through my head, which is, gosh, I really think I'm doing pretty well. I'm, I'm really good at this. <laughs> don't, don't ever, that's just pride before the fall, right? And uh, so Justice Ginsburg, who's a terrific questioner, uh, asked a very difficult question. I, I understood the question. I knew it was a difficult question. I started to answer it. And if you're a lawyer, you know what I mean. You kind of just sometimes you get a little lost. You get almost turned around too many times. Uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to know that point. And um, so I lost my way just a little bit. It's, if you listen to the transcript of the argument, it's not that apparent. Uh, to me, it seemed like about six hours of <laughs> trying to figure out what my next statement was going to be. Then another justice, like manna from heaven, said, Now, Mr. Sutton, you don't need to prevail on that point in order to win. Okay, now, you don't need a law degree to know the answer to that question, <laughs> which is, of course, yes. But I was so befuddled by Justice Ginsburg's question, plus I'm in the middle of the Supreme Court, everybody's looking at me, I don't know what I'm going to say, a lot of tension. I was so befuddled by Justice Ginsburg's question that I couldn't even understand those words. Mr. Sutton, you don't need to prevail on that point in order to win here. I, that could have been Polish as far as I was concerned. <laughs> I had no idea what this justice was saying. But you're not allowed with such a, <laughs> that's the problem with arguments, you're not allowed to say that. And, uh, so I did what lots of young lawyers do when they don't have any idea what the right answer is. I went in with great conviction, kind of read the visual cues. Again, I couldn't understand anything verbally. And I said, absolutely, Your Honor. Um, having, having no idea whether that was the right answer. Uh, this justice, realizing how pathetic this exchange looked, said, absolutely what? Uh, and uh, which strikes me as a pretty fair question. Uh, and uh, that, was the, that would have been, Greg, my last argument if uh, something hadn't happened or the beginning of other arguments. And happily, at that point, I kind of found the, the breadcrumbs and followed my way out of this dark, dark room and was able to answer the question. Um, that just gives you, it's a very formal, intimidating, but utterly exhilarating environment. I mean, what Churchill said about war, there's nothing more exhilarating than being shot at and missed, and that is the Supreme Court. It is the exact, <laughs> it is the exact same thing. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's a lot of fun. I really miss it. I, uh, as a judge, it's very hard to get an oral argument in the U.S. Supreme Court. We're not allowed to practice law, so I, I've been trying to finagle a way to do this, and I, some, some of the judges in the audience might appreciate this. There is one way for me to get an argument in the U.S. Supreme Court, and that's to do something so utterly outrageous that the U.S. Supreme Court has to do something that's called mandamus me. Um, so, for example, if during an oral argument, let's say I'm sitting there and I saw somebody in the back and I said, you in the red sweater, um, I'd like you to report you're going to be in jail for the next three days. I'm not allowed to do that, right? I mean, the person in the red sweater hasn't done anything wrong. There's no proof. Um, so he would get a lawyer and he would go to the U.S. Supreme Court and he'd say, Judge Sutton needs to be mandamus. He can't do this. But I would be able to defend myself, and I would have an oral argument in the U.S. Supreme Court. I, don't, I think it'd be a little harder than that first one, but uh, I'd sure love to be back there. Uh, it's really, a really fun thing to do, and uh, they're a great group to argue in front of. Sutton is asked what the greatest challenge of Republicans coming to the court are. I'm really, I'm really concerned about the, uh, the court. I, I'm, um, I, Greg's so nice, he didn't talk about my confirmation experience, which I'm going to get to your answer, but this is a way of setting up the answer. I had a very tough confirmation process. I was appointed by Bush, and uh, I got through 5241. I mean, that's, that's the I mean, it's like going for a D in a class, right? If you miss, you're done. You don't get anything. Uh, and it took about two years. And that experience made me think, um, and, and to make a contrast, so that was, I was put on the court five years ago. Justice Scalia, who's on the Supreme Court as opposed to the Sixth Circuit, is more, probably a little more conservative than I am, but he's a justice. He went through 98 to zero back in 1986. So what in the world has happened in the last 22 years that a justice on the court uh, goes through 98 zero in a court of appeals judge? Look at me, I'm a milk toast guy from Warren County. What could, possibly, what could I possibly do wrong? Um, gets through 52-41. Um, 
Well, one answer is that I'm a terrible judge, and we'll let history record, prove that. I'd like to think that's not true. What I think has happened is that both sides um, have really dug their heels in and have really said, we want judges to be on the court on the Republican side. They're one stripe on the Democratic side or another stripe. And what I fear is going on is that the people and the politicians are really starting to think of judges in the confirmation process is not that different from getting a bill through Congress. And I don't think appointing judges is, it's a political issue to be sure. I mean, the Constitution makes it a political issue. I'm not sure it's that kind of a political issue. But it's not one of these things we can control. That's the trend. Let's say the trend continues. So this is the real answer to your question. If the trend continues, what you'll end up with is courts filled with judges and justices that just reflect the American will. Well, in one sense, that's not bad because it's a dem democracy and we'd like to have judges and justices that reflect the American will on their various ideologies and views. But in another sense, it's terrifying. I mean, the greatest thing that the federal courts have done, the reason I think our court system is superior to any other in not just the world, but in history, is that we have this counter-majoritarian role that every now and then, well, with the U.S. Supreme Court, and more frequently with the lower court, federal courts, the courts say the democratic process has not worked here. The legislature has overstepped its bounds. The president has overstepped his bounds. And uh, you're not going to get that if you've got majoritarian courts. And so that strikes me as the ultimate risk. In terms of challenges for the court, in terms of types of cases, obviously these security cases are a, a, they're really having a hard time with the terrorism cases. And I think everyone in this room could figure out why. On the one hand, if you've got a real extreme terrorism threat, you, there are not too many limits you want to put on the executive branch in stopping it. On the other hand, not all threats are that imminent, that real, and not all people to be, deserve to be treated that way. So they're very difficult issues for the court to decide. And they're, they're struggling with whether they should be the ones deciding them or the president should decide them. Or if they should decide them, how do they decide them? How do you draw lines in this area? Um, and I think that's, that's been a struggle. I mean, this, this is, that issue is the steel uh, seizure cases issue. It's the exact same issue. The other challenge, I think, for the court's going to be all of these intellectual property issues and the biotech, you know, just what it means to have, you know, the ability of scientists to, to create these, these new forms of intellectual property and who has rights to them and um, whether the courts have a role in that area or whether they don't. Um, but I, I, I'm more worried about how we're putting justices on the court than I am about the cases they're they're facing. I think they'll get it right in the long run. They make mistakes, but they usually realize it. I, you know, I don't know what, what inferences you drew, drew from my distinctions between the composition of the Jackson court and the composition of today's court. I will tell you as a junior varsity judge, I mean, I report to them. I'm very happy reporting to them. I think it's a very good court. I think all nine of them are terrific. I think it's a balanced court. I think we have different perspectives. It's true we have just two Democrats. But Justice Stevens and Justice Souter, both Republican appointees, are not traditional Republicans. And, uh, and I think, I mean, in some ways you could argue Justice Stevens is the most liberal member of the court. Um, so I think, I think most views are pretty well represented there. And I think that's, that's quite healthy. Um, but it's, it's tough. Um, good question, yeah. Sutton is asked, how did the Jackson court run when the judge was at the Nuremberg trials? Great question. Had I been a Court of Appeals judge, I would have written a letter to the president. Hey, I'm happy to fill in for 17 months. Uh, that'd be really fun. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer for sure, but I can draw some, I'm pretty sure this is the answer from some things I do know. Um, what I do know is that when he came back, they had a bunch of 4-4 four, four cases, so they were deadlocked. That's a, eight is a terrible number for a court of appeals, right, because you can have deadlocks. And uh, so they had some deadlock cases. So when he came back, he was very busy because they had a bunch of holdover cases that were deadlocked 4-4. That makes me think they just moved ahead. They had no replacement judges, justices. And when they deadlocked, they waited for Justice Jackson to come back. Um, so I, but it's, that should give you an instinct or an insight into how extraordinary it was for him to leave for that time period. I mean, the question, I, maybe someone knows the answer here. Um, 
I would love to have asked him, are you glad you did it? Um, on the one hand, you have to say, of course. I mean, uh, how enriching, you know, what an incredible thing to have done and have done, I think, quite successfully. Um, he obviously was injured by not being in Washington when Chief Justice Stone died, so that probably meant he couldn't become Chief Justice. I, I, I would think the odds are high had he been in, in Washington fighting the fight, he would have been Chief Justice, so he might regret that. I would think on balance he was glad he did it, but I don't know the answer, and if someone knows the answer, I sure would love to hear it. A member of the audience comments that in 1947, the U.S. tried a Japanese general for waterboarding, and that currently the Attorney General thinks it is all right. Then he asked Sutton, where did America go wrong? Yeah, um, well, I have to be a little careful with these things because uh, they, they could come in front of the courts. Uh, that's such a classic song and dance for a judge, but I'm going to use it. Uh, you know, I, I, I should tell you about waterboarding. I, I read all these stories, um, so I'm very on top of the debate in Washington, the investigations. Um, everything I've read, I'm not quite sure I understand exactly two things. If waterboarding is one thing, in other words, if there's types of waterboarding, or, or if we're talking about just one thing, that's issue one. And issue two, I'm not sure I understand when waterboarding has been used, when it hasn't been used. In other words, whatever this policy was, I'm not quite sure I understand what that is. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, and, you know, you could say, you know, Attorney General Mukasey was not there when the policy was developed. Um, as he said in his testimony, he has some problems when it comes to opining on the validity of it today because there are CIA officials and other government officials that were under orders, were given permission to do things, and if the Attorney General today were to say that was illegal, that might be difficult for those employees. Um, and, uh, you know, so I can understand why Mukasey's position is, listen, rather than stating today in the abstract what, the, what is right or wrong about waterboarding, let's let this process play itself out. There's an investigation. Um, if people are tried, um, we can find out then what they did who ordered them to do it, did they have permission, um, and what exactly was it that they did? Because I have to say, I don't understand all of that. Um, you know, one thing about the waterboarding debate, um, you know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but and maybe it's unfair to say this, but you have to wonder, wonder, whether the debate over waterboarding reads a little differently in 2008 than it does September 15th, 2001. Um, the Supreme Court, as a matter of history, is more often been a follower than a leader. You know, they're, you, they're usually very attentive to what's going on in the world. And a lot of these debates, in my view, would have been seen through judges' eyes a little differently within weeks and months of 9-11 than they are today. You know, well, we're almost, you know, this, we're six and a half years after it. Um, back then, it wasn't clear whether this was one of many attacks and exactly what this war on terrorism meant. The thing that I think is troubling the court today, and I think troubles the public, is does the war on terror go on forever? Does that give the, the executive branch carte blanche to do whatever it wants and just invoke three words, war on terror? That's troubling to some people. There are other people that say, you know, once burned, twice shy, and, uh, you know, we don't want to have another attack. I, I'm not prepared to side with either of them, so I'm going to take the judicial oath of silence. <laughs> but it's a great point. It's a great question. Justice Sutton is asked, do you think the court should reflect the approximate demographic of the nation? Well, throughout history, that has been an issue. Throughout history, there have been seats based on geography. There have been seats based on religion. It took an awful long time for anyone to pay attention to seats based on race or gender. Uh, but there is obviously, there is, not obviously, but there is more sensitivity to that now. There's sensitivity to the fact there's not been an Hispanic. There's sensitivity that the bar is roughly half men, half women, and there's just one female justice, Justice Ginsburg, now that Justice O'Connor is retired. Um, I think the, those things are all legitimate because to the American people, I mean, the powers that be in Washington, there is a lot of symbolism that goes on at the top of each branches, the top of the judicial branch, the top of the congressional branch, and the top of the presidential branch. And symbolism matters. Um, 
On the other hand, I'm pretty good at, you'd think I was an octopus. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I don't, I don't like symbolic picks. I don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that's effective to put someone on the Supreme Court because of their faith, their race, their gender, or what region of the country they're from. I think that's a reason to look at a pool of candidates and say, we need to make sure our pool of candidates has some of these people. I think it might be a reason to say we, should, we really need to be thinking about someone, but if, you've got to be pretty good to be on the Supreme Court. And I think, and happily, there's only nine slots, so they should be able to find enough, <laughs> you, you, would, you would think. I don't know, is there time for one more question, or what do you want to do, Greg, here? Do you want to? What I want to do is thank you very much oh. for the well, story well, time. Thank you for uh, inviting me. To, uh, I got something for you. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.